Good evening, good evening, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Bible study where we dive into God's word. We certainly thank God for you joining us tonight, whether you're part of our New Hope family or you're a guest, we welcome you as you come with us tonight to look into the prophetic book of Isaiah. We certainly thank God for God's word and how it is sharper than a two-edged sword and how it is ministered to us through the years. And we hope tonight that something is said or done that speaks to your heart and to your situation. But before we get into God's word, uh, we have a lot to be prayerful about. Uh, we at New Hope have uh, had some great people, some giants in the faith transition recently. So pray for us. And we want to continue to lift up various families, especially the Hines family, our dear sister in Christ, uh, Sister Viola Hines. Often on these Bible studies, she would be one of the main people commenting and sending encouraging messages. And so we certainly are going to miss her, but we pray that God blesses and comforts her family. We do believe to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, but we want to uh, just continue to be sensitive in these moments as well as comfort one another. We're also in the midst of, of uh, uh, end of the year academically. We pray for our students, our young people, our families. Uh, we are in the transition of summer. We pray for those who do not have shelter uh, because the summer months and the winter months can be uh, very difficult without shelter. Um, people can uh, suffer from heat exhaustion and so many other things. And so we're praying and we're also seeking ministry opportunities where we can be a blessing to those who need food, who need shelter, who need things, various things, material things, as well as they have spiritual needs. So we hope and pray that you all are also praying for people all over this world. And we're still in the midst of a pandemic. As things are opening up across the world, uh, we do ask that you continue to be safe and exercise wisdom. Hear from God as far as what you do. They don't tell you what to do other than tell you to listen to God. And so I hope and pray that you are praying about all decisions you make, uh, whether you're wearing a mask or not, whether you're, whether you're eating in restaurants or not. Whatever you do, I pray that the Holy Spirit guides you rather than selfish or selfless and, and self-carnal uh, motivated decisions. Uh, let us pray. God, we come to you today asking for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, O oh God, for the many blessings we have received. And God, we pray as you pour into us on tonight from the word of God, from Isaiah chapters 55 through 60. That God, you make things clear and you make all things new in our lives. God, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for New Hope Baptist Church, where we truly believe there is no hope like new hope. We pray for each and every family, each and every individual. We pray for each and every community represented in this branch of Zion. We not only pray for the church which we call home, but we also pray for all churches all across the world. And tonight, where many churches are gathering to study God's word, we pray that the word go forth in the way God intends it to go. God, we also pray for this pandemic, COVID-19. We pray for those who are seeking help and rehabilitation and restoration. And God, we also pray for those who are seeking comfort. God, bless those who need shelter. Bless those who need your provision. Bless those who need your protection. God, continue to keep us. Thank you for your amazing and sustaining grace. God, in all things, we give you glory. And this Bible study tonight is not to bring attention to ourselves, but to bring people closer to you. So we pray, Lord, that that is achieved tonight. And as that is being done, God, we give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we do pray. Amen. On last week's Bible study and on Sunday service, we closed with Isaiah chapter 54. So we're going to pick up right where we left off, which is Isaiah chapter 55. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. It says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, 
my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Amen. I'm going to stop right there. This chapter, verse 55, God is instructing the people, stop doing things that are pointless and not meaningful. Focus on what is most important, which is God. Often people put their faith in God to the back burner. Uh, in fact, we even see it on Sundays. You see sports games, um, youth activities, everything is put in front of going to church. But I want to encourage you to, do not, to not forsake the assembly of saints, but to continue to seek God and gather with other believers. Make God the priority, not a priority, but the priority in your life. God has done so much for us. What God desires is a heart that seeks the Lord in all that we do, a mind that seeks God's counsel. So here Isaiah is trying to redirect the people of God because if we remember some of the previous chapters, uh, people were focusing on idolatry and everything else but God. But God wants to turn people's lives around. And in order for them to do that, they have to be following God. And so God, Isaiah instructs the people to stop focusing on all of these things that really don't matter at the end of the day, but focus on God. And likewise tonight, I encourage you, to spend more time with God. I ask you tonight, how much time do you spend with God? Do you tithe your time? There are 168 hours in a week. How much time do you spend with God? Is it just on Sunday mornings? Is it just on Bible studies? Do you spend at least eight hours, maybe even 16 hours a week in prayer, devotion? What are you doing to strengthen your spiritual walk? I tell you, the more time you spend with God, the more you enjoy the relationship with God. It's like any other relationship. The more time you dedicate with heartfelt compassion and heartfelt uh, love and heartfelt uh, genuine authenticity, or I shouldn't say genuine authenticity, but when you, have, when you have authenticity and true devotion, God does amazing things in your life. And so I encourage you. To spend more time with God and make the main thing the main thing. And that is God. And so the question asks, what is offered to those who thirst and have no money? Those who are seeking more out of life but do not have material things and resources to do it. The response is for them to seek an everlasting covenant with the Lord so that they can receive the sure mercies of David. God is is. Well aware, God is reminding them of the covenant that God made with David years ago, decades, centuries ago. The people of Israel looked up to David as a man after God's own heart, the king who was the greatest king on earth that they had ever witnessed. And so when they see that the same promise God made to David, God will make with them, their hearts rejoiced. They were glad. They said, well, if God did it for him, he could do it for me. Likewise, there are people in our lives that we see God, evidence of God's grace and God's mercy. And we can believe that if God did it for them, God can do it for me. But a covenant is twofold. It's not just one person dishing out. It is, a, it is another person taking responsibility, saying, I will do this. I will uphold my part. And so, as children of God, God holds us accountable. God promises things, and God holds us accountable. It is a two-fold relationship. When you make a covenant or a promise with God, you say, I will do this. And the covenant to be made was to honor the Lord, keep the Lord's statutes, live a life of righteousness, and make God the priority. And so as we do that in life, as we seek God, the rest will fall into place. God is not a man that he should lie. So if God promises, if we uphold our end of the bargain, God will uphold his end of the bargain. Amen? Amen. We'll pick up in verse 7, which says, Let the wicked forsake his way, 
the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. My God, so much to unpack here, so much just in this particular section, these seven verses, one of the things that jumps out, uh, we've often heard these passages quoted or referenced, God's thoughts are not our thoughts and God's ways are not our ways. God is higher. His ways and thoughts are higher than ours. You want to achieve greatness in life, you need to reach out to a greater source, which is God. If you want more power, if you want more understanding, if you want more of anything, you have to seek it from God. You also have to recognize that our God is greater. God is greater than our highs and our lows. God is greater than our thoughts. God has greater ways than the way in which we do things. People may be inconsistent, but God never changes. People may think negative things, but God's thoughts are so much more positive and greater. And so... We should have reverence for God, recognizing that God is greater. God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and God's ways are not our ways. And while you may be, while you may not be overjoyed over that, I thank God that God is different from us. I thank God that God is greater than us. If God was to the same level as us, he wouldn't be God. But we serve an awesome God that is so much greater, so much higher, so much further above than we are, and I find comfort that I can always look to God and seek God and know that God will not give me just the same advice any other person will, but God will lead me in a supernatural way. God's way is better than I can ever even do for myself. So we see here that one of the reasons we seek God is because God's ways are higher. We ask the question, how do we have joy and peace? We seek the Lord who may be found. And we call upon God while God is near. And even though other people, the wicked, may forsake his thoughts and his ways, we should always seek the Lord. And God's word, when God speaks to us, it will not return void. When God says it, often phrased, uh, quoted, when God says it, that settles it. It's true. God's word will go forth and it will not return to him void. And so if God is speaking to you, God gives a word into your life. Receive it and be excited about it because it shall come to pass. In chapter 55, God provides comfort for those who seek him, recognizing that God is greater. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. It is a continuation of chapter 54 where God promises protection and peace. And now in chapter 56, God extends this grace, mercy, and favor beyond the Israelites and offers salvation for foreigners. Let me read verses 1 through 8. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, 
The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. Wow. Lord says, keep justice and do righteousness. So you want to know what pleases God? Justice. You want to know what makes God happy? Doing the right thing, the righteousness. If we continue to do that and be steadfast in that, the Lord promises that soon salvation will come. That's the promise for the people of Israel. He says, blessed is the person who does this. People that seek righteousness and justice are blessed. This was not just a declaration for the past, but this is true even today. You never are in bad standing with God when you do right things by people. When you treat people right. When you stand up for justice and equality, when you live a holy and righteous lifestyle, you are never in bad standing with God. In fact, God declares that you're blessed. I'm wondering tonight, do I have any blessed people that know because, not because you've always done everything right, but there have been moments in your life where you've done things right and God honored it. There have been seasons in your life where you've sought the Lord and you're glad you did and God honored your pursuit. Here, God has promised blessed are those who, who seek justice, keep justice, and do righteousness. But he also says to the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord, to those who may not have been descendants of Israel or Judah, those who may not have always been exposed to the ways of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, yet they have faith. This is a very important principle because when we get to the New Testament over and over again, then we see especially Apostle Paul ministering to the Gentiles. While there were many who were apprehensive to minister to the Gentiles, God shows clear even here in the Old Testament that God loves also the foreigner. It is what is most important to God is those who have faith, who cling to the Lord, who seek righteousness, who do righteousness and have justice or keep justice and so there's a promise here that those foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him to love on the name of the Lord and they keep the Sabbath and they do not profane it they hold fast to God's covenant they also will be, will be brought to God's holy mountain God will make them joyful in the house of prayer some of you recognize this this scripture or this verse um, this, my place is a house of prayer. Jesus, when he turned over the tables at the temple and he, he chastised or corrected the, the money exchangers, the money changers, he quoted this verse in the, in the gospel. And so here we see Jesus using language from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 56 that God's house is to be a house of prayer. And people who pray, who keep the Sabbath, which, for clarification, is not Sunday morning. The Sabbath is the seventh day. It begins Friday evening and goes throughout Saturday evening. And those who keep the Sabbath, which many people could do a better job of, those who keep the Sabbath and keep it holy, God has a special covenant for those people. And he says, the Lord who gathers the outcasts of Israel, it means even the people that don't always keep justice or do righteousness, God still shows grace and pulls them in 
but he will not be exclusive to those in Israel, but even those outside. This is a word for all nations, for all people, for all tribes, that God will redeem you as well. Seek God, and God will, will pull you back in. God will redeem you. God will deliver you. God will take you to the mountain of Zion. Then if we move on to verses 9 through 12, the, the text shifts a little bit. Um, we see that God gives a place to the foreigners, the Gentiles who hold his covenant, that God is opening his doors to bless those who keep justice and righteousness. Then in verse 9 it says, All you beasts of the field come to devour all you beasts in the forest. His watchmen are blind. They are all without knowledge. They are all silent dogs. They cannot bark. Dreaming, lying down, loving to slumber. The dogs have a mighty appetite. They never have enough. But they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each to his own gain, one and all. Come, they say, let me get wine. Let us fill ourselves with strong drink. And tomorrow will be like this day, great beyond measure. What is the one condition that led to Zion's downfall? What, what is God addressing in verses 9 through 12? Shepherds that are all about themselves, who have no understanding, but have turned to their own way. Here, God is addressing bad leadership, selfish leadership. We are called to be servant leaders, where we have a heart for God as well as for other people. But when people, as verse 11 says, come for their own gain, that is bad leadership. When people don't seek God and to be led by the Holy Spirit, but rather try to use their own understanding. And the Bible tells us in Proverbs not to lean to our own understanding. But when people are focused on themselves and their own personal gain, that is bad leadership. And bad leadership leads to the demise of not only the leaders, but also those who follow them. So be careful about who you follow. Be very careful about who you cling to. Because bad leadership can have ramifications for not only that person, but also you. So be careful and be prayerful about your shepherds, whether it be pastor or your leaders, whether it be government, uh, on your job, whomever it may be. Leadership does matter. Chapter 57, uh, the prophet Isaiah continues addressing issues that have hurt Israel. Uh, he deals with futile idolatry. Let me read it to make it more clear. Verse 1 says, the righteous man perishes and no one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away while no one understands. The righteous man is taken away from clarity. He enters into peace. They rest in their beds who walk in their uprightness. But you draw near, sons of the sorceress, offspring of the adulterer and the loose woman. Whom are you mocking? Against whom do you open your mouth wide and stick out your tongue? Are you not children of transgression, the offspring of deceit? You who burn with lust among the oaks under every green tree, who slaughter your children in the valleys, under the clefts of the rocks. Among the smooth stones of the valley is your portion. They, they are your lot. To them you have poured out a drink offering. You have brought a grain offering. Shall I relent for these things? On a high and lofty mountain you have set your bed. There you went up to offer sacrifice. Behind the door and the doorpost, you have set up your memorial. For deserting me, you have uncovered your bed. You have gone up to it. You have made it wide. And you have made a covenant for yourself with them. You have loved their bed. You have looked on nakedness. You journeyed to the king with oil and multiplied your perfumes. You, set, you sent your envoys far off and sent down even to Sheol. You were wearied with the length of your way, but you did not say it is hopeless. You found new life for your strength, and so you were not faint. Whom did you dread and fear, so that you lied and did not remember me, did not lay it to heart? Have I not held my peace even for a long time, and you do not fear me? I will declare your righteousness and your deeds, but they will not profit you. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. The wind will carry them all off. A breath will take them away. But he who takes refuge in me shall possess the land, and shall inherit my holy mountain. So, a couple questions to ask. 
one question is raised in verses 1 through 2 where it talks about the good and the righteous passing away. But because there's so much wickedness going on, people don't understand what God is doing. God is providing rest and peace for the righteous people so they don't have to suffer because of the, the evil and the wickedness and the unrighteousness by the majority. Sometimes, and I want to say this for those, especially those who have lost loved ones. Sometimes God causes a loved one to transition, to pass away, so that they don't have to suffer and deal with certain people and certain things anymore. Sometimes God takes people away, not because of any wrong they've done, but because of the wrong around them. God cares enough about people to take them to a better place so that they don't have to deal with chaos and, and tribulation and trials anymore. So I hope you find comfort in knowing that God sometimes takes people so that they don't have to deal with negativity. Then he talks about the wicked in verses 3 and 4, sons of sorcerers, people that are all about magic and things not of God, uh, people who are offspring of the adulterer, um, children of transgression, people who are picking up bad habits and sin that has happened for generation upon generation. What sins were they guilty of? Idolatry, hurting the children, and sacrificing to false gods, and making alliances with other kings. Idolatry, making something else your god. Um, slaying children or hurting children. Many people today have been guilty of neglect, abuse, and abandonment, causing adverse childhood experiences or trauma to children. This is a sin and not pleasing to God. God bless the babies that live in these type of conditions in which people do negative t things to them, maybe even physically hurt them. My prayer is that God protects all children. My heart was saddened earlier this week. I heard of a story of a six-year-old girl who was shot in Philadelphia. We need to end senseless violence in our communities. As parents, we need to take better care of our children. Let us be led by God and protect them physically, protect them mentally and emotionally, protect their peace of mind. Let us be a blessing to our children rather than hurting them. Let us also continue to focus on God. Not everything else. Again, I'm, I know I'm beating a dead horse, but idolatry, sacrificing the false gods, takes you away from God. So as nice as that car is, it's not God. As nice as that house is, it's not God. There's only one God. And that's whom we should serve. Why would, or who would be the one to possess the land and inherit the Lord's holy mountain? Only those who put their trust in the Lord. Song says, I will trust in the Lord until I die. I hope that's your testimony tonight, that no matter what happens, you will trust in the Lord. Who will receive the promise of dwelling with the Lord, those with a contrite and humble Spirit. We see it in verse 15. Let me begin reading at verse 14. And it shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. Thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I will dwell in the high and holy place and also with them who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry, for the spirit would grow faint before me in the breath of life that I made. Because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry. I struck him. I hid my face and was angry. But he went on backsliding in the way of his own heart. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourner, creating the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So for those who have a humble, contrite, lowly spirit, will receive the promise of dwelling with the Lord. But for those who are wicked, there is no peace for them. God says for those who are humble, and show reverence to God. God will provide peace. And God will provide healing. For those who are wicked. It's not so. In chapter 58. Isaiah deals with true and false faith.
fasting. It says, why had their fasting not pleased God? Verse 1 says, cry loud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress your own workers. So why was their fasting not pleasing to God? Because they were exploiting people. They were exploiting their workers, people who were trusted in their care. And so here we see as fasting is one of the great spiritual disciplines, it must also be accompanied with caring for people. Prayer must be accompanied by caring for people. Any form of spiritual discipline or service must be accompanied with a loving heart, a genuine care for other people. And so as much as you can sing, teach, preach, whatever, you also have a heart that cares for people. That's what God wants. And otherwise, all of the stuff you do would be in vain. What kind of fasting would please the Lord? We see in verses 6 through 14. The kind of fasting that is accompanied with mercy and kindness to the oppressed, helping the needy, observing the Sabbath as a holy day to the Lord. Let me read it so that you know what I'm speaking from the Bible. Beginning in verse 6. Is not this the fast that I chose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, if you pour out, sorry, I lost my place. Sorry, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire, of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually, and satisfy your desire in scorched places, and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. I'm going to stop right there. But God basically wants our fasting, our prayer life, and everything else to be accompanied with mercy and kindness to those in need. Chapter 59 deals with evil and oppression. It deals with God not hearing people's prayer and people who have been guilty of certain things. One of the questions we ask in this chapter is why had the Lord not heard their prayers? Because their iniquities and their sin had separated them from God. Then of what kind of sins had these people been guilty of? What did they do that was so bad that God was not answering their prayers? Murder lies, injustice, and violence. I'm in verses 1 through 8 now. Murder, lies, injustice, and violence. These types of things had gotten the people so separated from God. Not that God can't reel them back in, but in this particular moment, because there was no repentance, no remorse, God left them to their own vices. Then, in their time of trouble, they come crying out, God, save me, help me, Lord, please. And God said, no. You've tried to do things on your own and you've been deliberately evil and wicked. And I tell you, child of God, I don't ever want to be in that kind of space. I don't ever want to be in a place where God rejects my prayers. And so these people had gotten so bad off that God rejected their prayers. And what Isaiah does for the people of Israel at this point in his prophecy, he acknowledges their sins and confesses, confesses their transgressions. And the Lord responds to Isaiah with salvation for those who repent and vengeance for his adversaries. God wants a heart that is willing to repent from your sins. So, I encourage you even right now, if there's anything that you need to give to God, anything in your life that has been so far off, 
so wicked, so evil. I want you to be encouraged and know that you can go to God for repentance. God will hear and answer your prayer. But you have to be willing to say, God, I'm sorry. God, I want my life turned around. God, I want to do better. Holiness is still right. Lastly, in verse 20, who therefore will come to Zion to turn those to those who turn from transgression? The Redeemer, that being God. God will come to Zion to redeem those who have turned from their wicked ways. And if you have been redeemed, the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I've been redeemed, bought with a price. Jesus has changed my whole life. If anybody asks you just who I am, tell them. I am redeemed. And we all wait for the day when the Redeemer comes. The future glory of Israel. Final chapter for tonight. Chapter 60. Which talks about the future glory of Zion. Where the light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon people. When the future glory of Zion arrives, what will the Gentile nations do? They will contribute their wealth. They will proclaim the praises of the Lord. They will ascend with the acceptance on the altar of the Lord. They will build up their walls. They will beautify the Lord's sanctuary. They will call the city of the Lord Zion the holy city. What will God do for those in Zion? God will bring precious metals instead of common ones. God will bring out the best. God will offer peace and righteousness. God will call the walls within which they are fortified in salvation and gates praise. God will be an everlasting light for the people. God will end the days of mourning and give joy and peace. God will cause the people to inherit the land and grow in population and strength. So here we end with this. God promises for those who seek righteousness, who seek the Lord, wherever you're from, whatever your background is, those who trust in God, those who do not engage in idolatry, murders, lies, violence, those who do not oppress their workers or those in need, there's a future glory. There's a future glory for you watching tonight. If you can repent and give your heart to God, there's a future glory for you. If you seek righteousness in God in all your ways, there is a future glory. This is not Pastor Max saying it. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. Good night.